So every once in a while, a game comes out and it truly surprises me. Willie Snell did that. You see, even after doing my research, I was expecting an okay-ish precision platformer, which would pretty much fully rely on its difficulty to stand out. And I hated the title. I mean, what does Willie Snell even mean really? But after beating the first boss, it hit me how much love was put into this game and how some really creative and smart design choices made some well-established genre tropes feel fresh and interesting. Hi everyone, my name is Venti and full disclosure, I absolutely love this game, even though it has a couple of issues which we'll talk about later. But without further ado, let's check it out. So what is Will You Snail? Well, it's a very fast-paced precision platformer, the likes of Super Meat Boy and Celeste, set in a virtual simulation. How fitting, isn't it? Where your goal is to get your titular snail to the end of the level. However, the evil overlord of this simulation, an antagonistic AI named Squid, will try to prevent this by predicting your movement and placing deadly traps along the way to stop you dead on your slimy little tracks. The main difference here is that instead of trying to get those pixel perfect jumps and getting into that rhythm like state of repetition in each level, here you always have to be on the lookout for squid traps. Sure, there's still that sense of learning the ins and outs of every level, which path is more dangerous, and even learning squid's behavior to try to one up him in the prediction game. But you are always on your toes, cursing at that single little trap he spun just underneath you at that brief moment of hesitation, sending you all the way back to the beginning of the level. <laughs> but not without taunting you with a clever remark about how you are so good at failing this level. Wow, you landed precisely where you weren't supposed to land. That requires some serious skill. Congrats! And speaking about failing, the game will by default auto-adjust its difficulty based on how good or bad you are doing at the time. Which, depending on how much of a masochist you are, you can always disable and adjust the difficulty manually. I did this and I started the game on its hardest setting, which is called Easy by the way, which had me raging for more than an hour in just the first four levels. Then I just dialed it down one level to very easy, where, although ashamed, I was quite happy with. And of course by happy I mean still dying over and over and shouting I hate you squid at the screen like a madman, but it was at least doable. And if you're not looking to headbang yourself over and over at a certain level, just leave the auto tuning on where the experience will feel much more tailor made for you. You can only move left, right, jump and double jump, but the controls feel really tight and responsive and eventually you do become one with the snail. Now, for those of you playing with a Pro Controller or anything with a traditional D-pad, I'm gonna recommend you something which I think is vital for this game. You see, the game doesn't have an option for rebinding the controls. I mean, sure, it's just left, right and jump. And the secret self-destruct button, which Squid so eagerly encourages you to abuse. But when you're flicking the D-pad left and right to try to avoid those dastardly traps, since many D-pads are single-piece plastic, they will tilt up unintentionally and probably get you killed since, sadly, it is assigned as one of the inputs for jumping. You can, however, map the buttons on the switch itself, so be sure to disable the up d-pad key. I did this and hallelujah, no more unintended snail jumps. Just don't forget to reset this after you're done with the game. Now, the thing that really made me fall in love with this game is the variety of game mechanics and the clever way some are implemented into it. Now, I won't go over them all, since discovering them was a huge part of my enjoyment of the game and I don't want to rob you of that experience. But basically, in typical fashion, the game will teach you about a new mechanic by presenting it to you in a very simple manner, its most basic form just so you get the gist of it. Then it will amp up the difficulty and overall complexity in subsequent levels, until it crescendos in an insane level where you have to have already mastered and internalized that mechanic, almost to a point of it becoming second nature, since most of your attention will now have to be on the extremely precise platforming needed to navigate through the level while reacting to Squid's constant pressure and attacks. You will eventually reach a boss fight, which will signify the end of that world and mechanical theme. For me, some of these boss fights were extremely good, while others paled in comparison to the standards set by these. 
At best, they are the most memorable part of the world and its mechanics, adding a very clever last twist to them. The very first boss in particular comes to mind, which stems from a very classic trope of gameplay, with such a clever twist which has you questioning how come no one has done this before, while at worst some of these fights feel like a somewhat simple variation of a mechanic that already has been fully realized and explored. So for me, these boss fights were both the best and the worst parts of the game. In between each world there are some light puzzles which amp up in difficulty throughout the game. You can always skip this though if you just want to get on with the platforming. For me, they didn't add much, but I think it's a nice pacing tool just to cool you down after a big boss fight. Now, like I said, the narrative of the game has you being trapped in a simulation being controlled by an evil artificial intelligence and it delves into themes of simulation theory and some of the existential questions that can be derived from it, like what is consciousness, are we real, and what even constitutes as real, and does it really matter? The whole cogito ergo sum argument and trees falling alone in a forest. I am a very big fan of these themes and philosophical musings, and even though the game isn't really about exploring that narrative, it serves as an interesting backdrop from which to tell a story. And this story is mainly explored through some logs that you'll find throughout the game which describe the events that may have led to the simulation. They aren't voiced, but they do have those kind of generic sounds that try to depict certain moods and feelings. What is voiced though is Big Mr. Squid, the evil AI. He has over a thousand voice lines for a plethora of situations and always has something witty and clever to say to add salt to the injury whenever you die. Oh, well punishment for wearing such a dumb hat. These are so well executed and add a ton of personality to the game and it makes it a much more engaging experience. The sound design is also pretty good with a fitting soundtrack to go with the cyber theme. I'm still really surprised by how a single person not only made the game, but a really good soundtrack and he also recorded all of the voice lines for Squid himself. As for the visuals, you can already see it's really minimalist, you know, that cyber neon design with flashy lights against dark backgrounds. Kind of like those RGB streamer setups, but still really fitting. You won't be immersed in this world or anything, but it's nice and serviceable. One thing I have to complain about though is that Squid's face, which appears almost all of the time floating ominously in the background, sometimes is a visual distraction or even ends up hiding some of the visual cues that signal an incoming attack or trap. You can always change the color palettes of the game in the settings to play it safe in a non-neon solid environment, but it just isn't for me as it makes the game much less attractive in my opinion. The game ran flawlessly on the Switch for me, I didn't have any drops in frame rate, and the game appears to be locked at 60. Although I did hear some reports of stuttering and audio issues over the PC side, but I really didn't encounter any problem myself. It's such a light and non-demanding game that I believe those cases may be just outliers. There are quite a lot of secrets you can discover which may have essential features like choosing a hat. For me it was a tough choice between the top hat and the little human riding you. Or you may even find the secret tower defense style levels with their own unique boss fight. As for the value, the game story will take you anywhere between 4 and 6 hours. Much more if you disable the difficulty auto adjust and name for those impossible clears. After that, the game still gives you plenty of reasons to continue, like finding every secret area, collectible, story log, and even backtracking to find secrets with an ability you unlock when you finish the game and even a pointless chill level where you collect happy points. I'm really sure if you wanted to squeeze every ounce out of this game, you could spend well over 100 hours, but I don't feel that's necessary, at least not for me. The game is worth 15 US dollars and I believe that is well worth it just for that first playthrough, but the incentive is still there for those who want to dig even further. And with that, I give Will You Snell a 9 out of 10. What a great game. So I absolutely love this game, I can't recommend it enough. I feel that even though it doesn't revolutionize the genre like Super Meat Boy once did, it is an excellent example of shaking up the formula and its establishments, all the while not losing sight of what the game sets out to be. And you can really feel the love and care that was put into this game. 
By the way, the game's creator, Jonas Tyroller, has a YouTube channel about game development and has a ton of devlogs about the creation of Woolly Snail. I'll leave the link to his channel in the description below in case you're interested. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed the review and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye! Mm-hmm.